Live from the UK, broadcasting around the world. Around the world. You're listening to the Mike Drop Club. Hosted by Douglas Hammond Dishe. Message received. Message received. You do not need to know what you need. What you need. Just engage with the podcast feed. Just engage with the podcast feed. Providing weekly insights into cool stuff we've read, saw, did, or heard about what made us say, wow, eureka, damn, nothing is off limits. If it motivates and inspires you to reach your goals, then it shall be discussed. Featuring guest interviews from high performers and people of influence and weekly awards for the best mic drop moment. This podcast is guaranteed to leave you pumped up for the week ahead. Don't just live life, make life boom. Hi, everybody, it's Doug Sam DJ with another episode of the Mic Drop Club. Today, I am super stoked, super pumped up. It's the first podcast of the year, and who better to kick things off than Liam Carhill? This is somebody I've been following on social media, LinkedIn, um, for quite a few months now. Very, really entertaining, really insightful um, pieces of content, all focused around digital transformation, changing organizations. He's a healthcare ad- advisor and mentor, and um, he's keen on social enterprises, and he's got a very unique way of delivering his content. Um, he's a founder of Technology Together, Technology Digital, should I say, and I just want to welcome him to the Mic Drop Club. So once and no further ado, Liam, how are you doing? I'm doing well. It's really great to be here. I feel like I'm sort of entering the fun club finally, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. We, we've been trying to get you on board for quite a while, just, just navigating your, your content and just seeing your vibes. And I think you definitely fit the, the make life boom, the whole mantra behind the Mic Drop Club, which is essentially to just share mic drop moments, whether that's to, through technology, transform, personal transformation. But I think the space that we're in right now, where technology and social enterprises, the human has become far more important in technology, in building um, value out of systems and the adoption of systems. So I, I am very honoured, Liam, that you can share your, your time with us this morning. Can't wait. So how was, how was your festive period in the first place? How, what did you get up to this festive period? Oh, a lot of coughing. <laughs> um, no, no, it was, uh, it, it was, it was good. A uh, particular highlight was um, being in, uh, in this, this weather system that we have at the moment in a safari park with a six-year-old trying to, trying to see the lions in, in the driving rain. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, but all good. And uh, to be honest, like, I think you can judge how your Christmas went by how you're feeling about coming into the new year. And I'm just, I don't know, like, as you can see, I've been back into my writing, like really sort of got lots yes. of ideas and enthusiasm for what we can do in this year ahead, really. So uh, that, that's the, the litmus test, I think, Douglas. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'm, a, I'm a keen advocate for writing as well. And certainly you kicked off with a question to your audience in terms of two two blogs, two blog titles that you are keen to, to put out. Um, well, are you happy with the audience re- response for the, the blog you ended up releasing first? Uh, it's pretty early. Um, I'll tell you what, actually, I got, um, um, I, just before this, uh, discussion, I got a message from someone I've never met before who basically said that they, um, like I won't name them, but just sort of said how appreciative they were that I took the time to write it and to try and fly the flag for community health services. Um, like it's an area I care about a lot and I've been working with closely. And I think, you know, when you see, you know, the, the work in the NHS that's taking place within that sector, and the lack of understanding and recognition for the fantastic work that they do. I'm like, you know, if I can play a small part in um, helping tech companies to stop trying to crowbar primary care or secondary care solutions into very different kind of service and any take note of it and start building solutions, then that will be the success for me, to be honest, Douglas. Oh, no, brilliant. Um, brilliant. And I, I totally echo that. And that is where you get what was called the first mic drop. Okay, guys, everybody ready? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's well, it's well deserved uh, i can assure you of that because um coming technologists should come from that place you know mm. opposed to wanting to shoehorn technology for their own uh personal satisfaction you know being able to articulate the the, the why why you want 
technology to work in the first place. It's so, so important. Mm. Um, as I was reflecting over key words of the last 12 months for 2022, key words in terms of digital transformation and the whole panacea of the words that we use. And one word that was glaringly obvious, it's probably my top 10, top five at mm. least, is this thing about digital disruption. Yeah. Disrupting services. It must be disruptive. You, you, it's everywhere. You even heard it on Dragon's Den numerous times. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's, so it's getting a mixed reaction, yeah? Can you yeah. help um, sh- share some light and differentiate what we mean by digital um, disruption? Yeah, like I think this is another one that goes in the misunderstood club, to be honest, because I think quite often, you know, we're talking increasingly about disruption. And what's really interesting to me is the Oxford Dictionary has two definitions of disruption. One is almost sort of like an anarchic way of ripping something down. And the other one, what quite interestingly, is... um sort of reforming and evolving and using using technology, you know, and like, which could have been the fire, the wheel, electricity, steam engines in the last industrial revolution to, to change and improve a system. And I suppose like we talk, I, I know when I talk to people sometimes about disruption, you can tell by their immediate reaction. Sometimes you get like a visceral reaction from them where they think that it's all about like, like, you know, sort of pirate sort of shaking shit up kind of things. Whereas actually, for me, disruption is very much about responsibility. And I suppose if there is, I suppose, particularly for public services, if there's one differentiation I can really provide between the difference between innovation and disruption, because we talk about two interchangeably. For me, innovation is very much around, there's a box around us, you know, and that is Mm -hmm. our prevailing culture, our governance structures, the way our organizations are run, what our job descriptions say that we can and can't do, all of these different things, you know, the rules that, that define our ability to change things. And innovation is often something that happens within that box, within the parameters trying to improve things. Disruption, and I think this is why it's so pertinent to this time, is for me very much around not doing those things on the inside of the box, but also addressing the box around us and saying, how can we be different? How can we think differently? How can we change the way that the, the system around us. So the system is fit for the, for the age that we're going into. And so for me, disruption is very much around that. So often it's more around responsibility than bringing things down, but it's about thinking differently. Um, yeah. So that's, that's my take on disruption. No, no, no. no. E- excellent. Excellent. I, I like the way you, you, you broke that down. It's almost as if I could paraphrase you, you take a look at the system, but you're, you're not looking at, you're not looking at a system to understand it. You're looking to like have a an overstanding of the situation. So the system is separate from you. And you're just trying to say, how can this system be better from the outside looking in? Because yeah. sometimes we could get we could get so close to the detail. So when mm. we hear words that are emotive, like this, you're so disruptive. I had that in my report card mm. <laughs> for many years. It's disruptive. Yeah. It doesn't have good connotations assigned to it. Yeah. yeah. Unless you can unpick that word, desensitize that word and put it in the context of a system operating in a, in a more innovative way for, for good. Yeah. yeah. And so, for example, um, it was actually the, the, the term was coined by Karl Marx and then it was picked up by the economist Joseph Schumpeter. And actually a disruptive system, a system that disrupts itself was seen as the sign of a healthy system. And so actually in this age where we have so much that we need to do and achieve, if we're not disrupting the system, then you know, by extension, we're, we've arguably got an unhealthy system, you know, and our economy, yeah. our public services, our businesses, you know, we've got amazing technologies that are landing now, you know, over Christmas, everyone was getting very excited about the application of large language models in, in society, getting maybe overexcited in certain parts. <laughs> and, but actually, you know, we've got these technologies that we can start applying, but if the system around us stays still, then it's just going to crush what we're trying to achieve. And this is why innovation fails so often. Yeah, no, no, yeah, you're right. Mm. And so so in a sense, technology, as we as technology evolves um, exponentially, you know, uh, as it is at, at, the, at present, and I think it will continue mm. to do so, it's closing the time for feedback, the feedback loops between an action and how the action is perceived, whether it's a good action or negative, is so mm. quick. So yeah. Apple will continuously iterate after six week cycles, another iteration of their, their, their platform comes out because either to service bugs 
or to bring in new features based upon feedback. So mm. the, the, the feedback loops that technology enables us to have makes us make, it's almost makes it incumbent on the supplier to make a decision. Mm. Are you going to continue innovate based yeah. upon the feedback that you are actually getting from your users, or are you going to continue on this, this road you're in? So that yeah. in itself creates a disruption. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, like in, in digital implementation, in complex human change, when just we're trying to get people to change state and obviously, you know, the nature of technology has changed significantly. Like 10 years ago when we were like, you know, like when we were trying to push through IT implementation, you know, back in the day, you know, back in the day, like generally it would have been a box, an adherence box, you know, I mean, lots of boxes, people would have had to fill in the box and largely we're just trying to make sure that people followed the process. Now we have open systems where we need people to change their state, to behave differently. And this is complexity. And so, you know, these are, these approaches that we're taking and that, you know, the <clears throat> existing approaches that we used to have around, well, you know, if we, we've got to plan everything in advance and work out everything that's going to happen and we can't really start it until we, until we've, we've kind of covered all of our bases. It doesn't work because humans are unpredictable. They're organic. They, they don't, we can't find out all of the things that we need to know. And so, you know, agile and trying to be iterative and working in loops is literally the only way that we can deal with these complex forms of change nowadays, you know? And so no. digital technologies and systems all the way through to just getting people to work differently, you know? No, no, absolutely. And there's, there's an element there where you you've actually led on to the next question is when we're talking about the human side of things and how debunking what it means to transform um, services, people, even places, you know, mm. which, which again is the, the focal point of all transformation. So you've done some debunking around disruption. Can you just share mm. with us what, what, what we mean when we're transforming services, people? Yeah. Well, places. I think the first thing is it's very difficult to transform people, right? We, we have this like, in, you know, in existing leadership, we have this thing where we like someone to go away and put how people are going to change in a nice convenient box that says that they're going to move from one state to another. That, state that we're talking about might be a huge emotional journey for a human being. It might be that there's all kinds of other factors going on that haven't been considered that for them, like means that this, this convenient thing that we like to give our leaders so they can tick a box is, is not necessarily realistic and practicable nowadays. Um, I suppose that the, to put this at like a bird's eye view, um, to take um, the uh, Sinofin or, you know, the sort of the, the, the Sinofin view of things around looking at the difference between sort of comple complex versus complicated. Um, and these two things, I think you, quite often we try and treat the world like it's complicated, like it's a set of predictable component parts that we can, we, if we get all the information, then we it, it will lead to success. But actually what I find in like coaching and working with leaders and doing my teaching is that, Many leaders don't really understand that complexity needs a different response, that for complexity, we have to be in it. We have to sense. We have to see what's happening and learn from the context that we're trying to do something in. And any other approach to complexity is going to lead to failure because we're creating some kind of fiction that we're hoping is going to come true. And, you know, I think there's a, you know, the, a couple of hundred year old mantra that sort of planning to fail is failing to plan. I think that's out mm. the window now for most of the change that we do. And actually, I think the, the new mantra kind of needs to be like, you know, failing to sense is planning to fail, you know, because otherwise, yeah. uh, otherwise we're not in reality. You know? Might drop a moment for you, Liam. <laughs> no, no, it's super, it's super. And no more is it fitting to discuss the, the business case. Because I guess this is where the, uh, the debunking of transformation really needs to, it's crystallized yeah. in that document, isn't it? In the business case, yeah. we've identified problem A. And we want to introduce this solution yeah. to change problem A to be either reduced or bring about a completely different state, which is state C. Mm. And as you're articulating people, places, and things, um, services are complicated. Mm. And you cannot really understand if it's true trans transformation, digital transformation, you're going mm. to get unquantifiable benefits or disbenefits in what you're bringing out. Yeah, and totally. I've seen so many business cases where they have not allowed a period of reflection to say, if this happens or to allow for opportunities to pivot. 
yeah, for example, yeah. uh, a very very loose uh, example. The guys that invented 3M, I think, the ones that invented the post-it note mm. out of redundant glue that wasn't working, but they found the colleagues sticking sticking these pieces of paper on objects. The company had to make a decision in mm. terms of the original use case for this solvent to how it was actually being used by their own employees yeah, yeah. and turned that into a multi-million, possibly billion-dollar product as a post-it yeah. note. So how many organizations do we see in this digital space that are so are welded, bonded to the original business case? How many tech leaders, change agents, transformational leaders, you know, that are, are want to shoehorn the yeah. original use case, even though the outcomes, the way it's being used in the world is changing? Yeah, totally. And, you know, that's a, that's a huge mindset change for leaders and it's a cultural change. And I think they haven't really been helped to understand. Like, actually, I would go as far as say that I work with a lot of executives who are actually very panicked. Like I, I worked with an executive who left their last job because digital transformation was coming in and they weren't sure that they, were, they had the confidence to do it. And actually it was a great leader who I've been working with, um, who, who, who absolutely would have been a fantastic leader of digital had they been supported mm. to understand, to just think about things differently. But I do a lot of work with boards actually. And I talk about like presupposing the solution and, oh, here's a great idea. And everybody, you know, it's human nature. We all go in for a big idea, but then what happens is, you know, and I've been a non-exec, I've been an exec, I've sat in the ivory tower, right? And people send something up and lots of things happen in this, in this room, which is entirely outside of the context of where actually great things can happen. And, you know, like as a very, as a non-exec, you know, sort of my my first non-exec role, I was really keen to help come up with solutions and suggest things. And people gravitated to it in the boardroom. I had like, it was a wound and lymphedema organization. I had no knowledge really about wound and lymphedema other than a few pathways that we built in my other organization. And yet we all gravitated towards this thing. How did I know as a non-exec that that was the right thing? And I think I work with boards to kind of say, like, like, if you want the perfect plan, someone will go and build a fiction for you. Is that what you want? Or are you willing to let go and be able to trust that actually by iterating and trying to find the right success, then, you know, then, then we need to try and take an approach that reduces failure because it's connected to the work and it sees it. You know, and I think one of the things about, you know, I think, I'm, you know, I know you're a massive ad- advocate of Agile, Douglas. And, you know, I think for me, like absolutely too, although we get it horrendously wrong in public services. But for mm. me, the problem I think that occurs often with Agile, and this is where the boards play a really big role in the leaders, is like we kind of think that if maybe we give Agile like a nice turd, like a nice steaming turd, that Agile is going to help polish it and turn it into a diamond. But actually, I think this is where design thinking comes in, where we need to understand the nature of the problem and not presuppose solutions. And this is rife in health and social care right now, whether that's coming down from national bodies who have no real idea about what's happening in a service, mm. of which I've been given many examples, or whether that's coming from other places. We're still over presupposing solutions that are, we're then putting all of our energy into trying to implement the wrong thing. And that's a huge problem right now because as you said that post-it note that great residual win can only really be found in the context in in, in what's happening in real time exactly exactly mm. and you're getting greedy we, we're we're nearly halfway through this show and you've got two mic drops but you have another one for that because it's it is well deserved i, I can i can i can assure you that our listeners are definitely are engaging with with with, with what you're saying um when we talk about um, digital transformation in the context of of understanding a system, and I think system mm. is the right word. I um many moons ago, I done a high national diploma sponsored by mm. uh, Toyota. Um, it was called Mechatronics, mm. and um, I studied at degree level as well. Um, but it was essentially set up by Toyota in the eighties. The methodology mm. was this: all the engineers have to be trained in all aspects of engineering, mechanical, electrical, testing, computer, um, drafting, all aspects of engineering. The whole rationale is this. So when they're building cars, you know, that there was this big thing in the 80s, 90s, you're probably too young to remember this, where you had nice concept cars that came out, nice looking concept cars that never made it to production. It's because those concept engineers were not mechanically trained 
computer orientated electrical engineers mm. that had no idea. So when it went, went, so when they tried to implement that, it would break down. And also, mm. what they found was um, to ensure that productivity remained at an optimum, they wanted to know that the engineers can move anywhere across the production line if somebody was ill. Mm. They can work in, across the whole board. Um, I find too often within transformation, the one trick pony, you know, I'm, I'm a business change engine. That's all you know. Yeah, oh, yeah. I'm a clinician. That's all I do. You know, in mm. this siloed way of working without understanding how each piece is um, symbiotic to, to the greater whole, you know, and yeah. where those touch points are and having a respect for those touch points. So I think sometimes we can recognize Ooh. your nurse on the ward, patient is going to be discharged into the community. You know that, mm. but you don't really respect it because the way that you document will not support your colleagues to yeah, yeah. understanding what to do with this patient. So we've got a lot of these um, narrow-minded views uh, coming to play within health innovation. So there's a big piece about uh, where do you see where we can re-educate the educators on mm. system, system-wide digital transformation? Yeah. Well, firstly, I couldn't agree more with what you're saying, Douglas. Um, I think, you know, um, we are still using, a, we are using a 103 year old blueprint to decide how we organize and how we define our services. Um, Henry Winslow's, um, principles of science, which they applied to organizations, which is basically that the man shall be reduced to his role. Obviously it was the, the man back in those days, but the man will be reduced bound to his role and he will take that specialism into reducible parts. And, that was for people who were working on production lines. As you said, it was a very much mentality of this. But nowadays, what we have, for example, is we say digital project, well, that has to go to the IT team. But actually, the th something that I say very often to organizations is, what's easier to learn? How to use a piece of technology or how to deliver a complex care service for a particular group of patients? What is the more important thing there? And I had a real light bulb moment when I read, uh, I can't see the book right now. Oh, there it is, The Second Machine Age. And there's, um, it takes an economic theory of what's called recombinant innovation. And what it says is that every single innovation that's happened has happened because of two things, two ingredients. Number one, technology. Um, a new technology which can be applied in different contexts or a general purpose technology or a, or a single purpose technology. Um, and the second one is the context. And so, for example, you know, um, I was watching um, Chef's Table over Christmas, right? You know, and it was like the one about people using fire. They, the person, like someone who could be an expert in fire isn't going to create the world, the world's greatest dish. But teaching a fantastic chef who understands ingredients and understands how to cook and what people like and flavors and taste is, is the context where when you apply Absolutely. that. So we need to start working together so much more and we need to start recognizing the importance of the context. And actually philosophically, when I work with organizations to drive experiments, it's very much around, well, let's empower and create partnership with the clinical services, with the clinical teams or the back office teams who know their work. And let's try and, you know, give them the means to learn this technology and then apply it. And the successes I've seen in my, in, you know, my last four years in doing this has been so, so much better than some PMO or IT team, some specialist team trying mm -hmm. to deliver something into them. Liam, Liam, you're bringing the fire like Prometheus. <laughs> <Not a drop. laughs> All right, I just, it, I, I get so excited about this stuff. <laughs> yeah, so... So whilst we're on this journey of re-educating the educators around, Ooh. so there must be there must be work done at edu at degree level. Right now, as we mm. see it, we've got people that work in, across the health panacea for different specialities that don't train together, have mm. a common understanding of digital technology. Doctors typically don't train with nurses. Nurses typically don't train with social workers. You know, mm. care support staff might not even, might not. I know some of them got, have qualifications where they go to universities, but either way, mm. there's, there, there needs to be some harmonizing and some yeah. common understanding and respect for each of these disciplines for, for this to actually to, to create that context. You know, cause sometimes we, we deliver, we, we deliver care as a clinician myself. I'll tell you, I've delivered care mm. out of context because, for example, if you look at one bird flew over the cuckoo's nest, many of those practices still take place today on inpatient wards. We will discharge mm. a patient, mental health patient, typically based upon their ability to conform, to adhere, 
to subscribe to the treatment plan in the hospital, mm. i.e. the mortal yeah. patient. They're taking the medication, they're saying all the right things, so you can be discharged. Yeah. That, that is a parameters, that is the parameters that we use to this very day to discharge patients. Mm. And we use such words as a settled. What does settled mean? Nobody knows what mm. settled means. Right. So if you look at the context, as you're rightfully saying, that person is living at home. So you can be discharged from an inpatient unit without demonstrating some of the core fundamentals that you need to be able to enable you to be self-sufficient, independent at home, such as taking medication mm. as prescribed. So the tenor, having a patient queuing up for medication and taking it because you're giving them is nothing compared to them when they're at home with their dosset box, taking the medication at Absolutely. home. So the context yeah. is, is voided in particular environments. We're not bringing the technology to bear to support um, patient empowerment. You know, um, the true recovery model is almost mm. like you get admitted to hospital and for every passing second a minute, you're becoming more and more de-skilled. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's a big discussion at the moment about how do we how do we fix the NHS? How do we solve it? Like the NHS is buckling under its knees. And I have to say, I got quite angry this morning listening to Radio 4 when uh, one of the Labour MPs came on. I'm not being political on either party here, but like one of the Labour MPs came on and spent a lot of time criticising the, the existing administration, but then had no constructive suggestions for how we can change it. But for me, it's actually a lot more simple. And, um, you know, um, I know this is kind of moving away from technology or technology plays a huge part. But actually, if we take the inspiration from Burtzorg, right, and th keep thinking about context, right, Burtzorg in the Netherlands is, in terms of outcomes and health outcomes, is one of the most successful one of the most successful organizations in the world, particularly in community care and, you know, community nursing, and gets really great outcomes that helps keep prevent people being admitted to hospital, which obviously is the crisis that we're facing at the moment. What fundamentally is happening in that? Is there some grand philosophy that's being shared? No. What's, being happen what's happening is they're creating a system so people can work together and learn for ideas, but they're also trusting individual teams more generally to be able to solve problems in real time and to have and to focus their attention not on telling these teams what to do but on how to support them and i think the example that you've just given is 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 a is a great example of the kind of potential that we have that we lock down in our surrounding system because our system is so focused on effectively wins like you know politicians want short-term targets from national leaders national leaders have to respond to that you know they're all they're all working in the headmaster's office now um you know ics is a great opportunity to to create place and stuff but it's also been it, there's also a series of short-term intervention targets where if spend over a certain amount including on tech projects gets spent then it has to be signed off by someone very senior and so i think the problem that we have at the moment is that we're not willing to accept that this new world needs a new way of thinking. This Winslow time is dead and we're going to kill our public services if we keep doing this. There's a total deviation, but like... Yeah, no, no, if, it's good. And so, you know, um, there's a, in the book Brave New Work there, I think there's two simple concepts, which I think is really fantastic, which is we need to become more complexity conscious, as we've discussed, but we need to become more people positive and we need to actually trust people because I can't, I've lost count of the amount of times I've worked in an organization and someone's lent over to me and said, well, you know, we can't just give them free reign to do whatever they want to do because it's going to be a yeah. total mess. Is it? Is it? You know? And oh, that's wow. the same applies wow. to technologies. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're so right. Trust is, is is massive, and even trusting people's ability to fail. If you, I, I would live in a coaching um, course at Kingston University, mm -hmm. and I was talking about recovery and care planning, how people recover, and I asked the the, the cohort, how many of you, and probably the average, the mean average age must have been thirty five. So you had a broad mm. spectrum for people fresh out of A-levels and people who are more mature. So mean average, probably 35. Mm. I said, how many of you can raise your hand with all honesty and say to me that when you were 14 years of age, you planned to be a nurse? How many? Mm. No, one person, one, two people out of a class of maybe 25. The rest, I said, the rest of you have gone on a career journey where you try different things. Yeah, mm. failed at different things, tried different things. But mm. it's okay because you don't have the stigma of mental health to contend with. 
And so we are saying to patients, we don't trust your ability to make decisions for yourself. Yeah, but yeah. we're coming from a position of failure ourselves. It's very, mm. very important to, to surrender that because it's not ours in the first place to take away from people. So I take what you say um, um, to heart because this is something I really, really push in yeah. all of care. This element that you have to trust the, um, the, the recipient because it's not only it's their data, it's their bodies. Mm. They're carrying their bodies. They're, yeah. They are experts based upon lived experience. We are yeah. experts based upon academia. But the true context is when those, those two worlds coalesce and the sweet spot is in the middle where you've got mm. the knowledge and the experience combined to bear so that somebody, patient, individual can make that informed decision for what's right yeah. for themselves. Might not be right yeah. for me but it's right for them at that time and they're making informed decisions. And this is where I see technology mm. playing such a pivotal role and changing. Did you not mention the Burzog model in Netherlands? Is that uh, what you mentioned? In, in the Netherlands, yeah, yeah. Um, phenomenal, phenomenal yeah, model of reversing everything. Yeah, like I did a talk for a group of nurses last year, I think. And I was trying to, and I, I did a couple of sessions for a few different providers on there, like Champions programs. And the thing that I was trying to sort of help them realize is that technology isn't something landing on your head and you living with the consequences if we do it right. What it should feel like is like a jetpack, like you've been given like an Iron Man suit or something, right? It should feel like you get extra powers because out there in the world, there's people who living in their mum and dad's basement who are building like sophisticated, synchronous, virtual, asynchronous businesses and content. We could do with all of that stuff in the NHS right now, yeah. but it comes back to the box. And this is why my mission is about like, I'd not swear, but like, but it's, it's about taking a hammer to this, take, helping us realize that we need to address the box because otherwise people aren't going to have the agency to do these things that you're describing. But if we've got a need for progress, technologies that can give us superpowers and can give frontline clinicians superpowers that are much more usable and understandable, uh, understandable than before. And people who, when really supported to understand, are incredibly willing and actually super proud of what they can achieve. Like, you know, I won't list them, but I've got some moments of such significant pride where someone who I've been facilitating in a frontline service has come up and gone, guess what I created? I had this patient and described a really specific patient need and then talked about the thing they did. And no central organization would have planned for that because it happened in the moment. That is superpowers. And that is so, I want every clinician to, to, to not feel like technology is something that's going to create negative consequences. And we've got to, we've got to, we've got to tackle the box for that to happen. Brilliant. Right? Brilliant. Brilliant. Do you struggle to achieve your goals or to find your purpose in life? Why waste your time dreaming when you could be fulfilling your biggest, boldest, brightest goals? Tune in to the Mic Drop Club and listen to guest speakers and people of influence as they reveal their secret techniques to help you to get to your dreams and goals and turn them into reality. Do you struggle to prioritize your tasks to achieve your goals? Surely there's a better way. We don't have to land in space to be great. Frankly, we don't need to, but given the opportunity, wouldn't you like to do something spectacular and make an impact? Tune in to the Mike Drop Club, where the secrets behind achieving extraordinary results are shared weekly with your host, Douglas Hamandache. We'll be with you every step of the way, giving you all the motivation to not just live life, but to make life boom. I know the last 10 years we've tried to readdress this this um, failure culture, you know, mm. where you get reprimanded, you can lose your position, you lose your, you lose face, you know, it's mm. career cul-de-sacs if you introduce technology that doesn't go according to, to script, you know, we need to um, yeah. continue on that journey and allow people to learn lessons. I think as the 50 plus organizations that make up the NHS, right. Mm. They need to get together and really start sharing their, their, their failings. You know, there's no central repository of, of failed technology. You know, there, there are um, elephant graveyards of technology in every hospital, some yeah. filled with iPads, some filled with um, poor adaptations of, of um, visual devices. If mm. they only were able to be honest enough and share that, it will save a lot of money, effort yeah. across the whole board. 
Totally, Douglas. And like, you know, the, the adage that those who fail to learn from the past are destined to repeat them. Well, like, you know, in my career, like my first part of my career was building a community organization where everybody was doing everything fragmented on their own. They were repeating and duplicating, but they were also duplicating their failures. And so actually, if we had an environment and, you know, I don't think there's a, the environment, I don't think the environment of the NHS, particularly up there, could be any more toxic in that characteristic of, not allowing any failure to happen, like, you know, and that perpetuating downwards into the systems. But like, Douglas, you've had, you know, you've had lots of successes in your career. I've been very privileged to have some in mind too. And let's be entirely honest, we've been successful because we have made and then been able to learn from a thousand failures, right? It's not because we've had great world changing light bulb moments and then just smashed it out the park. Quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. It's because, you know, every success that I've had has been because of failure. Failure is the best learning tool. It's how we grow in our own selves and therapy and life and all of that. So why Mm -hmm. wouldn't it be the case in our organization? So without our ability to, to positively celebrate noble failure as the term goes, Mm -hmm we're going to, we're going to, we're going to repeat it. We're going to perpetuate it. Yeah, absolutely. Nelson Mandela did say there's only two states that can happen. Either you win or you learn. That is it. Um, So if we continue to embrace that philosophy, have it enshrined, you know, Mm. as a mantra, but it's just maybe the, the, the difficulties or the complexities is around the fact that we're impacting people's lives. And so that's where we need to have some sort of safeguards in place still um, but I think the fundamental philosophy is if something's happened, what was the learning aspect from it so that we can move yeah. forward? And that's shared across the whole health um, health, health system, as it were. I'm very conscious yeah. of our time because we can, we can yeah. really go off, off on one. But <laughs> um, one thing that's very clear from um, this conversation is you listen with an intent, an intention. You know, I'm watching your your eye, your iris and everything as a you, you listen well, with some an intensity <laughs> that I don't I don't see often. You know, some people listen to just re- to respond. You know, but they're listening to understand. Talk to me about that approach of listening that 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 you use. Um, well, thank you, but I actually don't think I'm a good listener. I think I have to work very hard to be a listener. And actually, there's a lot of as a as a as a leader of sorts. I think there's a lot of things that like naturally or in the counter thing, you know, I'm too, like I talked about presupposing solutions. If ever there's a journey that's been taking me, I come up with ideas really quickly, but actually I'm a terrible leader if I just then start marrying it and, you know, raising it and loving it and and nurturing it in my head, because I'm not going to be able to listen to others really. So like, I think, you know, we've touched upon quite a lot of the, a a lot of the elements around, around really listening in organisations. But I think, you know, one of the great things is, is that we, have a better ability to listen to people more than we did before. You know, like in organizations, it was very difficult pragmatically to be able to listen to everybody in the organization. But actually now we have all of these digital technologies that allow, you know, and this is about changing the system. If we want to have a listening system, why don't we focus our attention? I've just helped an organization with their digital strategy. And the year one strategy is about building the systems that allows people to listen, to share. So the system itself can change, you know, you know, um, how do we build, how do we use technology to build the right environment? So our capability to deliver more increases, you know? And so for me, I think, you know, listening is incredibly important, but I think we've also got to make sure that we're listening to the right people. And I don't know, like I'll be, I'll be careful about naming this project, but I worked on a very high profile project where a load of like young design thinkers kind of came in. And what they thought was that if they listened to the patient, all about the patient, then like they would get all of the answers. But firstly, it's about listening and understanding the complexities of the system. But also what we found in this particular project was it was about general practitioners and patient experience. And we thought, well, GPs, they know the patient. They they understand the context of what it's like being treated. And we asked them a question about care. And they were like, yeah, it's all fine. Da, 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 it's all great. You know, we're managing to do this. They had a delivery oriented model because they deliver. But when we spoke to the patients, open questions, genuine research, what we found is that they're like, well, my experience is like it was during COVID, you know, my experience is I don't want to bother the doctor. But actually, I've got all these problems I didn't talk about. And, you know, like, and so we've got to make sure that we are covering all of the bases where the experience happens. So, you know, in organizations, one of the most important things we could do is help to develop and improve personas, that we start to use them as living entities in our organizations, that we start to 
not make decisions about people without engaging with them and listening. them. And I think, you know, listening as a personal activity is something that we need to do and that I try very hard to make sure that I'm doing as well as I can. But I think we need to think more, you know, more sort of systematically about how we become listening organizations because, you know, boards, leadership teams, yeah, there might be lip service, but really listening needs to be something that is done systematically. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, if I can build with you on, on that, that example very quickly, um, I was doing a, a research piece um, about mm. 10 years ago on mental health patients and um, mm. who they value the most in the health system. You know, mm. who's the closest person to them across the health system. And um, what we've discovered through these interviews that we were having with various people, our initial thoughts as to who are the most important person to a patient, you know, mm. well, were debunked very, very quickly. You know, we had the psychologists who thought that the patient would think they're the most important person because they hold the keys to their freedom to be discharged, medication, all of these things. Mm. The nurses were saying, but hey, we... We see, the, we see the patient every day. We have an intimate relationship. Then you mm. have the psychologist that say, oh, we have a focused one-to-one session once a week. The mm. patient will surely say us. And it went yeah. on and on to student nurses, to uh, all sorts of people came out. Yeah. What, what, what turned out to be um, <laughs> revealed in, in, in this, um, this um, test was the closest person, the most valuable person to that patient was their benefits officer. Mm. Their yeah. benefits officer. Yeah. Not the psychologist, not the nurses, you know, not even the family members. It mm. was a person that controls their ability to have income mm. that will allow them to do the things they want to do in their lives, you know? And the same, yeah. same, same experiment was conducted within an inpatient environment. And they concluded in an inpatient environment, the closest person to the the patient is a receptionist. They had the time to listen. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, hosp- the, the, the ward clerk we're talking about. Yeah. They had, and the ward clerk doesn't do any of the clinical stuff in terms of um, assessment, implementation of care. Just the ward yeah. clerk is just somebody that's in the office mostly doing the administrative stuff, making mm. sure the ward runs according to, 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 to time schedule and all those things. But the patients mm. still identified the ward clerk as somebody that yeah. is so crucial to them, you know. Um, but then you ask yourself this question, when you talk about re-educating the educators and talk about systemic mm. working, you know, having walk clerks yeah. are trained in therapy. Yeah. And actually what, you know, you're, what you're describing to me, Douglas, is a, is, a, is a really good example of where we're addressing where the problem is and what, like, you know, what is the actual problem or what is the actual scenario that's taking place based on what we think it. Because no matter how much we know in our job, If we are doing something that affects users or affects others, which is the vast majority of our our jobs, we are all in an iceberg of ignorance in relation to parts of it. We might know our scenario, our worldview, but, you know, and like, you know, I've I've dealt with clinicians who've been very staunch with, you know, I I know, you know, um, you know, um, we had one in palliative care where, you know, we were trying to talk to people in end of life care to understand their experience. And this organization had done little research in the past. And actually, you know, there were some individuals who were like, I understand what my patients need. You know, I, I can help do this. We don't really need to engage with them. And I had to sort of say, well, okay, maybe you understand this much, but what about this in the periphery? And what about if this, this bit here yeah. in their experience that you don't live because you don't have their experience, you're not dying. You're not in a situation yeah. where you're receiving palliative care. So why, why wouldn't we ask them, you know, and it's, yeah. it's difficult because we feel very protective about it. And again, I think this is about safe cultures and about, about, you know, creating the right environment for people. Yeah. And there's the element of paternalism that we have across health. Yeah, like, totally. We know better than you. We are your, like your parents, you know, the whole, um, whole bring back the matron scenario that happened, mm. you know, pre COVID, we need the matron back. So she could tell the patients what to do. She will make sure the wards are clean and blah, 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 you know, when it's not about that anymore. I think the evolution of care is not treatment focused anymore. It's recovery inspired. You know, mm. how can we give back? For me, I know as a clinician, now my role is more as a, as a signposter, as a mm. coach, literally as a cheerleader. Woohoo. You can do it. I'm, I'm more supportive. Like, what do you need to thrive? And let me yeah. see if I can influence the system so you can get access to those things so you can live your best life opposed to, you know, 
take this course of medication and you will be better, you know, but by, by metrics that we will measure for ourselves. So it is, it is, um, it's one that we're on a journey. And um, yeah. I think the more conversations we have with like-minded people like ourselves, you know, sharing mm. that out, the more it becomes normalized. And I'm just keen to, to yeah. ask you, like, we talked about our successes and, and it's yeah. born out of the failures of others and even our own failures. But what yeah. sparked that in you to be able to be in this position where you can challenge, you can speak truth to power? You know, what, yeah. what was it in you that, what, what does a clinician need or somebody in the health system need? Yeah, you know, yeah. A, a, so, a little, little, if there was an ingredient from Liam that they could just sprinkle on them, so what do they need to, so that they can start challenging some of these yeah. um, concepts? So it's, it's very like, you know, I, in running my program with people in organizations, I think it's, it's very easy and convenient for me to kind of take some of the attributes that have made, allowed me to be able to kind of get to a position where I, I don't just speak truth to power. I get paid by organizations to speak, um, to, to speak truth to power. That's a tongue twister. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the thing for me is, is, I don't know, like through my journey, I've always had a, I've always had a tussle been tussling with authority like you you know my report card said disruptive not knowing i was going to be teaching the topic later in life <laughs> um and i think for me i was always battling the system and always battling authority when i felt there was a different way of doing things i think the thing for me is and this comes back to being people positive right like i got i went through in my career a period where I kept questioning authority and I managed to be successful increasing, and you know, the timing of this digital industrial revolution and the age that we're in is great. Maybe 20 years ago, it wouldn't have been so successful, but like as in going through to that particular time, like what I've come to realize is that for one of me, who's kind of keeps on pushing and keeps asking questions and trying to change the system around me, there is somebody who's told, no, you can't or this is the way things have to be, or get back in your place, or this isn't for you, it's for somebody else to say. And to be honest, like the next generation of society, we need to re-engage these people. We need to help people who've been told no throughout their careers, that there is a different way of doing things. And so I suppose, do you know what? Like, I'm just going to borrow from the, uh, you know, the wonderful mantra of Barack Obama and like, we can, yes, we can, we can do mm -hmm. this and we can question authority. And actually the success of, the Western world and the democratic society depends on us engaging people and helping them to start really thinking critically with an intention to improve it around us. And it's hard. Like I spent a lot of time working with people who think, no, we can't. And I have to try and work really. And it takes a lot of time mentoring and supporting them. But, you know, I think for those who maybe feel that that's too overwhelming or that, you know, the bit, the things that I've done, maybe they wouldn't be possible for them to do. If we all move the needle, the world gets better. If we all just try and change a little part of the system, then things can really snowball. Okay, guys, no, ready? excellent for that one. And you know what, again, you're getting greedy. That is one where you need to just take a break and, you know, for two seconds, reflect, let that marinate, let that marinate to any of those clinicians out there who are doubting the, their, validity or looking for validation before they speak truth to power you don't need mm. to you know you do your research there are books out there that can support the way you think and challenge yeah. challenge that's the only way we get to to change the system that that we have for the for the better so a massive mm. double mic drop for you liam for that one that that is so so important <laughs> if you can leave a message to anybody to inspire them is is exactly that you know you can read about all these broken mics, Douglas. <laughs> 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 it feels like it feels like it feels like landfill. You know, I'm I'm worried about the environmental consequences. Uh, do, do you know what? The earth always rebuilds itself, and that's <laughs> something we need to uh, recognize. But it needs help. It needs support, and that's what we're talking about. You now, these yeah. you know these epiphany moments. Mm. You don't get it every single day. I don't yeah. know if we're talking to you, Liam, I've already got my boost for the week. I got my, <laughs> my shot, you know, I can engage in the world. And so we have these platforms. I think it's incumbent on us to, to share these conversations because the solution mm. is not out there as such. It's within, you know, the, mm. the box analogy that you break down. Um, I love it. I, I love it. You know, that box is also within us ourselves. You know, so we need to first manage that, that our internal box before we could take on, you know, the cubic, Rubik's cubic of life, you know, and work and relationships because all, all coalesce. 
It's like as someone who likes breaking the rules, I'm going to give you a mic drop for that because that's a, that's a, <laughs> that's a, a wonderful. It's a wonderful conclusion, I think. You know, absolutely. It's the journey oh, within wow. us, right? Wow, it has been. Do you know what? It's been magic. And um, if I can borrow you for just a couple more minutes, just to talk about this accelerate pro- program that you have going on as well. Yeah, and yeah. How how can people um get hold of you? Uh, yeah, so um, I suppose as as you probably worked out, <laughs> we probably covered in this. I, I passionately like to share ideas, and I want to help organisations to 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 try and think differently about you know the wider the wider things that we need to cover in our culture, our skills, our governance, and all of these different things. So um, over the last couple of years, I've been building a program, uh, two programs actually, one for like executives of frontline providers, and the other one for people who are in transformation or in frontline clinical care um, who are trying to almost trying to think about the pragmatic elements of this. Yes, we can, I suppose. What does this mean? How can we, you know, how can we change our thinking? Um, so at the moment, I've got a bit of a hiatus on the wider programs because actually I've got a real yearning to get back into some organizations and work hands on. So the thing that I'd say is I am, if it, you know, if any organizations would be interested in a conversation about internalizing the program. That's kind of, for me, the next phase that I'd really like to explore because I'm just, you know, it's easy kind of being in your ivory tower, kind of sharing this stuff, but like, I like mm. it in the muck with everybody else. And so, you know, mm. um, that's, that's very much for me. Um, in terms of how to get hold of me, um, I'm all over LinkedIn, like you are Douglas, yeah. you know, you can't, you can't miss me if you're connected to me on LinkedIn <laughs> because there's usually something <laughs> coming out. And so that's always a really good port of call to, uh, to engage. And, you know, as you mentioned, like, I love sharing ideas. I love writing and I'm always putting content out. I've got two coming out, two articles coming out this week. And, you know, um, it's just really wonderful when I get those messages and get to engage with people about this stuff. So, you know, if you, if you want to connect and sort of, you know, challenge and debate some ideas, then that's, that's where my place is. Fantastic. Liam, one more time. Thanks a lot for gracing your presence on the Mic Drop Club. We look forward to round two, three, four, and five. So, um, yeah, we salute you. (laughs) Have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. So, yeah, that's a recording. Done. Boom. And that was, how long? I think it was one minute, one hour, one minute. Yeah, perfect. Excellent. Excellent stuff. So how is it for you? Yeah, it's really good. I really liked, um, you know, um, on some of the other podcasts that I do, I tend to just get straight questions, but it's just really nice to have your experiences and insight that you put in. That's actually one of the reasons I was quite, you know, quite quite keen to do this with you because it's just, it's nice for it to be more like a conversation and for you to be sharing your experience as well. So um, yeah, really, really nice. You know, otherwise I just worry that I'm always just like lecturing and I don't want to, yeah. you know, so really good. Really enjoyed it. I've got, I've also got that buzz for the, uh, for the rest of the day. Oh, super, super. So I can't wait to, I can't wait to mix it down. I'll, I'll do it within the next couple of days. So I'll get, get everything, get all the assets to you as well. So you yeah, get cool. all that, all, all the assets. So you can also slice and dice. I'll slice and dice as well. And I think yeah. once you play it back and listen, there might be themes that might coincide with some of your blogs, you're doing all that kind of stuff. I can also share it via, you know, Centric Health Media as well, so we can yeah. get some more traction um, with with the content as well. But yeah, give it a listen. There was so much in there. Like I said, I was getting greedy. You know, normally I <laughs> actually have the button ready to go, but I've changed my Wi-Fi code, so my whole, my gear for my live effects are not there. So I've got to do it in post, but it doesn't really matter. But I, I think that there's, there's certainly um, opportunity for us to, to collaborate further there are lots of projects taking place at the moment yeah i'm working on a project to bring um personal ro- or robotics into the nhs um mm. which is again changing not changing as such just advancing the whole um mindset of what ro- robots can do in the home even yeah, you know yeah. so um yeah i would I'd be keen to get you on board in, in some shape or form and all, all other fancy stuff that we do yeah. with um, Centric Health Media, which is promoting innovation. Let's, let's um, call this the start of a beautiful friendship. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. I think so. I think so. <laughs> so, yeah, Liam, I'm not going to take any more of, more of your day, but no, I salute you. Thank you well, very much. You. Have a blessed day. Take care of that back as well. And we'll yeah, catch up. So yeah. all and you, all t- you, you know, I hope your 8020 manages to, to turn into a solid 100 over the next few oh, days. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Don't forget to check out micdropclub.com and get the show notes and useful links. Subscribe to the podcast. Don't just live life, make life boom. Boom.